So first physical exam. So as you know, because a lot of you have a lot of experience now taking care of cancer patients. So for head and neck cancers, oftentimes the extent of the cancer, you have to do an exam and it's much better appreciated on exam on than on imaging, both by visual inspection. That's not my, that's not my hand, by the way. Just have to put that out there. So, so visual inspection, help patient to see how deep the tumors are, particularly helpful for oral cavity. This was a patient with an oropharynx cancer that's involving most of the soft palate, and then this was a larynx cancer. So if you compare it to their preoperative diagnostic imaging, you won't see anything on a CT neck, which is the bread and butter for diagnostic images in most centers. You know, if you get a PET scan, sometimes you may not even see a CT correlate, you may just see a punctate focus of uptake. And similarly, if you get a CT neck with contrast as diagnostic imaging, you may have some suspicion that there's soft palate invasion in this particular case, but it really doesn't tell the full story. And then same thing I would say with the larynx cancer here, direct visualization really is king. Okay, so just a quick plug for physical exam, even in our um, even in this. So diagnostic imaging, needless to say, is very important. I'll go into some of the imaging modalities, but not just any neuroradiologist, but a, neuro, but a neuroradiologist who's very familiar with head and neck cancer, because I don't know what the, what the paths of training is in the Philippines, but in the United States, in, within radiology, so neuroradiology is a fellowship, and then head and neck is a part of that. So a lot of people go through neuroradiology fellowships without really developing an expertise or interest in head and neck uh, imaging in particular. And there's very few fellowships in the United States that focus on head and neck imaging specifically. So for example, so we had, so this paper came out of our group a couple of years ago talking about the influence of having um, a neuroradiologist QA our, our volumes, and most of the volumes got bigger. Over half of the volumes um, had changes to them after review, and you can see that for some particular subsites, you have more changes uh, than others. So a plug for developing a friendship with neuroradiology. Okay, so this might be old hat for a lot of you, since it's part of your since it's part of your day-to-day -day life. But you know, we depend on, aside from exam that I talked about, we depend on very high quality diagnostic imaging to be able to delineate where all the cancer is. So a question often comes up, do you get a, a CT or do you get an MRI? And there's really no gold standard for all the head and neck subsites. What you'll often find is that it really just comes down to your institutional preference, or maybe even the patient preference. Maybe the patient just can't lie down long enough for an MRI, and so you have to get a quick CT neck. And oftentimes, there's they're equivalent in terms of the value they provide. So you know, especially for for nodal disease, there's really not a difference if you get an MRI or a CT. But sometimes MRI is better. This is a segue from the talk from last week from Dr. Samvi. So, you know, as you all know, you cannot treat a nasopharynx cancer, especially one where you suspect that there's skull base invasion or intracranial extension. You just cannot treat a disease like this without an MRI for proper delineation. I noticed that there were several oropharynx cases that we'll look at later today, but here's a plug for MRIs for oropharynx. And you know, big or small, MRI provides a lot of value for oropharynx cancer. So for the small ones, it really helps the surgeons, especially, especially looking at how inferiorly or, or, or deep the tumor goes before they do a torus resection to make sure that they have, they're able to clear that margin, which is often very difficult to clear. For some of the larger ones, MRI can make all the difference in staging T4 versus not. So here's at the bottom right is a, is a T4 base of tongue uh, cancer that was only appreciated as being T4 based on MRI. You can clearly see involvement of the uh, genioglossus or extrinsic tongue muscles. Welcome. <laughs> 
Uh, and then there's other scenarios where MRIs can be very helpful. So for recurrences, for perineural invasion, which I believe is one of the later talks, and then also for cases where there's dental artifact or, or, or hardware for reconstruction. MRI is not always better. Sometimes CT is better. And probably the best example of this is for larynx cancer. So as you, as you know, uh, MRI is very sensitive to motion. And if you don't give the proper instructions or if patients can't follow instructions, then it's very hard to make sense of what is normal and not normal within the glottic larynx because of the amount of uh, motion. And then even if you order a CT, it's very important that you don't have to know exactly what the patient is doing as part of the protocol call, but you just have to make sure that your radiology department is protocoling correctly. So I can tell you the number of times where we wanted to image the larynx and the image came out like the bottom right because they're doing a breath hold. But as, as a lot of you know, in order to properly view the, the larynx, uh, really quiet breathing is, is the instruction that the patient should be following. So sometimes CT is better than MRI. We all love PET scans, but PET scans, you can have false positives or false negatives. False positives, you may not really encounter that often. I think what we tend to encounter more commonly are false negatives, either from really small nodes or from, from nodes that are maybe more so cystic or necrotic that don't have uh, a lot of uptake. This is an extreme case of brown fat, but I think all of you knew already that all that lights up is not necessarily cancer on a DG PET scan, but PET scan obviously. So ultrasound may not be that helpful for you to delineate a GTP, especially for mucosal squames. There's generally a limited utility. Probably the main use of, of an ultrasound at least in our in, in in my practice is just for guidance for for biopsies. In in all of head and neck, I would say the main exception is for is, is for thyroid cancer, which ultrasound is really the preferred imaging modality and is superior to both uh, CT and MRI in terms of characterizing thyroid nodules. Okay, so those were just some general tips on diagnostic imaging and and when you might prefer one modality over the other. So now that you've done your exam, you have the imaging that what you want to use to draw. Now the patient is in your department for a CT simulation. So I just have one slide on this. This is probably, you know, a very standard thing that all of you know. So I, you know, I won't, you know, I, if, if you want more details, I'm happy to talk more about this, but Pretty standard, you choose a short mask or a long mask. In this case, we have a long mask. Generally, we have their necks in a neutral position with their shoulders down. Now that pretty much we routinely use, uh, you know, VMAT or, or you know, other forms of, of, of IMRT, the neck position can be more or less neutral. We don't tend to uh, uh, overextend patients' necks anymore as we more commonly did in the 3D era. So it has to be a comfortable and reproducible position with both the mask and the headrest. You have to scan enough. So typically as a general rule of thumb, you wanna make sure you scan beyond five centimeters of the target both supinymph. You have to make sure that the slice thickness is, is thin. And so for, if you're doing SBRT, it would be even thinner slices, but I would say no thicker than three millimeters. IV contrast is obviously very uh, important for being able to see gross disease on our scan because then our scan becomes a pseudo diagnostic scan. Or if you don't have the capabilities of using IV contrast, which, you know, for a long time we did not use IV contrast for head and neck scans because we often ordered same day diagnostic scans that we would fuse to our CT. So there's different workflows that achieve the same thing. So you don't necessarily need IV contrast. So there's dental hardware. You want to have good reconstruction techniques that reduce the amount of artifact that you see from scattering. And then, especially in post-op cases, you know, this is a talk on GTV. Sometimes you're doing a post-op case and there will be unexpected GTVs. So 
we'll get into looking at individual cases a little bit later. I just wanted to talk about some specific things about going from a GTV to a CTV. So based on your exam, based on your diagnostic scan and your CT simulation, you draw a GTV. How do you go from that to your 70 gray volumes? This high dose or 70 gray CTV is about uh, a five millimeter expansion from your GTV. So by way of example, you know, here's, the, here's a GTV of the primary and here's a GTV of the node. And uh, you expand it by five millimeters and then you edit out based on a hard anatomic boundaries and you take away non-contiguous mucosal surfaces. So it doesn't really make sense to skip across if they're not contiguous. So there's a lot of, so I can just say from general practice, there's a lot of consensus around this notion that around the green, there should be about a five millimeter margin before you get to the red. There is not, at, so even though it's part of these consensus guidelines, I would say in general practice, if you ask around what people do, there's not as much of a consensus around this next point, which is that to go from your 70 to your 60, you should, if you should intentionally expand another five millimeter. I do as part of my practice, but I can just tell you that it's not, this, these are just more anatomic, or these are more site-specific pearls that can be instructive when you are drawing your GTV, because in addition to what you see on diagnostic imaging, having a good handle on anatomy can give you a lot of insight into where the tumor is, maybe hiding, and where the tumor is traveling. So this is just basic anatomic review. The main point I want to make here is that tonsils are very long supinate, so it's very common for people to underdraw the supinib extent of, of tonsils. The other thing I would say about tonsils is that they head towards the retromolar trigone. So the other common pitfall with tonsil cancers is underdrawing the extent heading towards that corner there to the retromolar trigone. Base of tongue. Um, sorry, was there a question or was that just my feedback? Okay, I think that was just my feedback. No, it was just a microphone. I'll okay. control the microphone, so this is great, thanks. Okay, so let's see, how are we doing on time? Okay, so I think we're doing okay. Okay, so just a couple more pearls on specific disease sites. So base of tongue, and as you know, you know this might be insulting for you, but just remember the lingual tonsil is really synonymous or is located in the base of tongue. So I wouldn't say common pitfalls because I'm sure nobody here makes any mistakes, but just, just be mindful of the extent, you know, base of tongue cancers tend to go into the pre-epiglottic fat, which you see on the sagittal here, and they tend to extend anteriorly because in both of these directions, there's no hard anatomic barrier. So when you draw your GTVs and expand it to your CTVs and you're evaluating gross disease, look in both of these directions to see if you might be missing a tumor going downwards and going forwards. Okay, I think these are just some examples of tonsils and base of tongue. So this was so this I mentioned after you draw your GTV and you're you're doing your expansions, just be mindful of heading in that direction that I was talking about towards the uh, the retromolar trigone. In the more inferiorly, you're more superior. Um, at the upper pole of the tonsil, then you're more talking about the maxillary tuberosity. Um, Supinymph I was talking about, so it's important for tonsil cancers in particular to include the ipsilateral, include the pterygoid plates. And then this was just illustrating the point I was trying to make about base of tongue cancers. Because there's no hard anatomic barrier, they tend to creep behind uh, or going you know, shoot downwards into the epiglottic space, posterior to the hyoid bone, and then also anterior into the floor of mouth. So just be mindful of these places. And then, and then for, and for base of tongue, it's not necessary to always cover the, the, the pterygoid space, uh, plates as you would do for a tonsil cancer. So those are just some tips for oropharynx cancer. So for nasopharynx cancer, and you know, just to make sure I don't lose anybody. So I mentioned that to go from green, the, the green GTV to the red CTV70, 
pretty widespread agreement that five millimeter is a good rule of thumb. And then now I'm just talking about the 60 gray, so that extra ring beyond the 70 gray. And so there's a little bit more variation and it's a little bit more complicated here. Might be a little bit easier to look at these case by case, but these are just pathways of spread for nasopharynx cancer that I think a lot of you are, are familiar with. So be careful of your, your, um, your cranial nerves, your skull base, and other pathways of spread for nasopharynx cancer that you might want to include in your 70 gray volume. Okay, so oral cavity cancer. Typically, we see these in post-op cases, so it's really, it was a relatively small primary. It's good to communicate with your surgeons to get in the habit of sending you these patients before, because you want to have a mental image of what the tumor looked like before it was resected. So, so the only point I will, the only point I'm trying to make about, you know, this Kind of goes for all post-op cases, but I would say especially for oral tongue, just it's it's a very common, I wouldn't say mistake, but it's a very common habit that people get into for undercovering the the deep extent. There's not a real consensus on how deep it needs to be beyond the resection bed, but you need a deep, but you need to have adequate deep coverage because that's pretty much where the recurrences always are. So in this ex example, so we fuse the pre-op imaging to the CT SIM scan, and you can see where the original tumor was, and that can give you confidence in knowing that you're drawing the right area. So sometimes the reconstruction, so in the previous case, is a relatively straightforward reconstruction. So sometimes the anatomy changes a lot, and you have to know, you know, oftentimes we spend a lot covering the actual reconstruction, but then lose sight of the native tissues out immediately outside of the reconstruction. So in post-op larynx cases, for example, pretty much the, you know, the, the local recurrences that happen in post-op cases always happen at the anastomosis. So you have to make sure you cover the base of tongue well, and then also the, the inferior extents. There's going to be a dedicated talk on perineural invasion. So I won't go into that much detail here, but you know, even if you, for example, have a relatively small GTB, going from a GTB to a high-dose CTB for skin cancer may not be trivial because both retrograde and anterograde skip lesions are possible and you have to understand the perineural pathways. So this is just V2, for example. A lot of people have a lot of confidence in drawing V1, but V2 is a little bit more challenging. Okay, so this is just an eye into the future. Probably over the course of your training and, you know, things change all the time. So this may be refinements to the workflow or framework that are talked about that will help you draw GTVs in the future. So for example, you know, there's, you know, this was a nice demonstration of a way to assess the extent of the tumor before surgery using a dye labeled to penetumumab, which targets EGFR receptors. And so basically at the time of surgery, it lights up as green, they resect it, they put it, and into an imager to see if they achieved an adequate margin. So maybe this will be a so maybe this will be something like this will be a part of our workflow in radiation oncology in the future. So functional imaging is changing all the time. So everything that I talked about in terms of delineating GTV was just based on anatomic imaging, but this is perfusion imaging. Probably the most widely studied is DCE, but there's certainly a lot of different uh, ways to image perfusion MRI, such as ASL or yada yada. So this, we haven't really incorporated functional imaging routinely into radiation oncology, but it's been worked on for a long time and it may happen soon in specific scenarios. This here is a gallium uh, 68 PSMA PET. You may be more familiar with the scan in the context of prostate cancer, but there's also emerging data that for certain thyroid cancers or salivary gland cancers, it's a sensitive marker to detect recurrences. So maybe we can find more to add to our GTV using this as part of our armamentarium. So diagnostic imaging will change in the future. CT simulation. So this is already, so, so in our department, we, 
are integrating MRI simulation for, for certain situations, but it's more or less still a research activity at this point. We're not routinely doing it. Everybody still gets a CT simulation, but this is what it would look like. And then at some centers, they have PET simulators. So, you know, so already a lot of departments are moving beyond just a CT simulation. And so you've seen the consensus guidelines. They're pretty much based on a combination of clinical outcomes and pathological studies evaluating beyond what is visible, how far tumors can spread that is not visible to the naked eye just by a certain number of millimeters. So for that reason, a lot of the consensus guidelines for a lot of the disease sites we treat are even though they're not meant to be a uniform expansion, we at least start with a uniform expansion and then try to shave off. But the real pathways of spread may be much more, you know, maybe much less uniform and much less straightforward. So do they follow along nerves? Do they follow along certain pathways? So this is just a plug for machine learning and radiomics, which is not yet part of our workflow, but as you know, is an active area of research pretty much in every department. So in summary, in order to draw a proper GTD, you need to examine the patient. Oftentimes it's more important than it's more important than imaging. Number two, diagnostic imaging is important. I gave some general pearls that you probably know already about MRI and CT, but more important than anything, I would strongly encourage you to develop a workflow with your neuroradiology colleagues. CT simulation come up with a good protocol so that you can actually see and contour properly. But from the patient's perspective, it really needs to be reproducible. And then to go from a GTV to your CTVs, I think that like I was saying, there's a lot of consensus about getting to the 70 gray volume, but to get from a GTV to the 70 gray CTV to the 60 gray CTV is not so trivial and it's very site specific. <laughs> 